Here are the relevant parts of two simple shaders. They output the same thing, except shader A calculates the result, while B reads it from a texture. Which one do you think is faster? It is natural to assume that it's B, because it just grabs the pre-calculated result while A does some sort of math. But it is of course a trick question. It depends a lot on how exactly you are measuring it, but the bottom line is, shader B performs at best about the same as A and can be much slower. The unfortunate reality is that compared to processors, memory is very slow. Imagine if you were a clerk and could fill a paper in about a minute, but you had to wait for each paper to be delivered from the storage for an hour. This is the scale of potential inefficiency we are talking about. In this video I'll try to briefly explain how the hardware is designed around this problem and give a few tips about what we as programmers can do to make better use of these designs. Let's start with CPUs. Memory fetch from RAM can take tens or hundreds of times longer than most arithmetic operations. If nothing is done about it, a CPU will mostly sit idle, waiting for queries to complete. To mitigate this problem, engineers take advantage of data locality. CPUs have a small amount of very fast memory, called cache. Instead of bringing only what was requested by the CPU, the memory bus can fetch a whole chunk of nearby memory. Then, when you say loop over an array, after one fetch from the RAM, a bunch of nearby elements will be in the cache and accessible really quickly. When a memory read is satisfied by the cache, it is called cache hit, and when it isn't, it's called cache miss. It is important to keep caches in mind when you work on performance critical code. For instance, if instead of actual data, an array held a bunch of pointers to random locations in the heap, we would have cache misses all the time. Making your code cache friendly is a big part of a design paradigm called data oriented design. It is popular in game dev, and I have some links in the description if you are interested. Now let's move to GPUs. Just like on CPUs, one of the main sources of latency there is memory access, so there is also cache. Its architecture is different, but the general idea is the same. Importantly, GPUs also take advantage of their parallel nature to hide the latency. Let's start with an abstract example. Say we have a single processing unit, a CPU core or a GPU equivalent, and a bunch of threads to work on. An obvious way to schedule the work is to just execute the threads one after the other. But when the processor encounters a memory fetch operation, a texture read for example, it has to wait for the fetch to complete before it can start to work on the next part. To better utilize the processor, upon encountering a memory-related command, we can switch to the next thread. After going through all the threads, the processor will come back to the first one, and hopefully the memory read will be complete by that time. Unlike the cache, this doesn't really make the memory reads happen any faster. It just serves to keep the processor busy and hide the latency. Why am I attributing this kind of optimization primarily to GPUs? CPUs do the same all the time, to, for example, hide the wait times on things like web requests or hard drive memory reads. When a CPU jumps between threads, it's called a context switch. During the context switch, the CPU has to store the state of the current thread in the RAM to continue the execution later, and fetch the state of the next one. So you can't hide RAM latency with a context switch, because it will cause a comparable additional delay. GPU threads, in contrast, have a little bit of their own memory to keep their state. So, GPUs can switch them with practically no overhead. On that, let's stop with the theory and talk about some practical applications. I'm not an expert, but I've been learning graphic stuff for about a year, mostly in relation to my pet project, an ocean system for Unity. So, I'll try to give you some tips based on my experience. First, mandatory reminder. You need to profile your code. Hardware is way too complex and diverse to reason about the performance without data. Profiling shaders is a bit harder than CPU code, but there are dedicated graphics debuggers like RenderDoc and specialized NVIDIA and AMD profilers. They look a bit like an airliner cockpit and their timings might not be accurate in terms of the absolute values. But comparing the timings of the different parts and versions of your code relative to each other will help you make educated decisions about your programs. With regard to memory access, the two important things are throughput and coherency. By throughput I mean the amount of memory your shader needs to touch, and by coherency I mean how local and hence cache-friendly the access pattern is. To optimize for throughput, you first and foremost need to pay attention to format of the textures and render targets. Here's an anecdote. I have read in the Unity manual that pretty much everywhere except mobile platforms, GPUs always use 32-bit floats. 
Naturally, I formatted all the render textures in my ocean system like this. Later, however, I've been looking at the graphic studies of big games, and I noticed that these games use all sorts of formats for different purposes. The Unity manual wasn't wrong, but I misinterpreted it. It is all 32 bits only in the shader program itself. For the textures, you should use the smallest precision that works for its contents. When I changed the format of the buffers in the simulation from single to half precision, which was more than enough in my case, the performance doubled. The program was severely bound by memory throughput, and this simple change halved the amount of memory that needed to be transferred. Now to coherency. Perhaps the most important cache coherency optimization in computer graphics is MIP mapping. When a texture gets minified, which means that its texels become smaller than the pixels of the screen, we've got a problem. Each screen pixel samples only a single texel, or four nearby texels in the case of bilinear filtering, when in reality in this situation its color must be some sort of an average of a bunch of them. It creates aliasing and flickering. MIP chain is a set of progressively smaller and blurrier versions of the original texture. The GPU can detect that the texture is minified and tries to pick a smaller version whose texels are close in size to the screen pixels, which helps to reduce aliasing. This is a visual part of the technique, but it also has a performance purpose. The neighboring screen pixels sample texels of the minified texture that are far away from each other. This breaks the locality of memory access and causes cache misses. But when a smaller MIP level is sampled instead, the pattern becomes cache coherent. So don't disable MIP maps unless it's necessary. Another simple thing you can do is to pack your data. Textures can have multiple channels like red, green and blue but data often comes as a single grayscale value. Sometimes you have several such data layers that you are going to access at the same texture coordinates. A textbook example of this is things like roughness, metalness and occlusion for PBR shaders. Then you can pack the data into the channels of one texture. All the values you need will be right next to each other in the memory and you can grab them in a single read. I think what we've discussed so far is a solid basis, but I want to talk about another, slightly more involved thing. You might have heard about compute shaders. They are a tool for general purpose calculations on the GPU. Vertex and pixel shaders have a specific function, while with compute shaders you can do whatever you want that would benefit from GPU parallel compute power. For instance, you can use them to run particle simulations, generate terrain or post-process images. Compute shader programs are called kernels. You tell the GPU to run this kernel on a given number of threads. Usually, each thread processes some one thing, like a texel or a particle. To identify which thing it is supposed to work on, the thread is provided with an ID, three integer numbers. There are three of them because the threads are organized in 3D space. It doesn't have any performance significance and only serves for convenience. If you say you want to process a 2D texture, you can run a corresponding square of threads. Now, let's talk about some optimizations compute shaders allow with regards to memory access. Compute shader threads are run in groups. The number of threads in a group is specified above the kernel, again as three dimensions. What does this grouping do? Threads in a group can efficiently communicate. For one, you can synchronize them using barriers and atomic operations. More importantly for our topic, they have access to a chunk of physical memory dedicated to the group, called shared memory. This shared memory is not large, but it is very fast, on the level of the cache. Say we want to blur an image. It is a memory-intensive operation, because for each pixel we need to read a bunch of its neighbors from a buffer to average them. Some blurs, like for instance Gaussian, are separable, which means they can be split into two one-dimensional passes. For a size n blur, we get from n squared to 2 n reads per pixel. A lot better, but in case of a large blur, it is still a bandwidth-hungry procedure. And if you think about it, a lot of these reads are the same. Two adjacent pixels share most of their neighbors, but both fetch them nonetheless. What if instead we run the threads that blur a line in a group? We then could put a whole line in the shared memory. The pixels will get their neighbors very fast from there, and we will actually read each pixel from the texture only once. In practice, such optimization won't necessarily improve the performance of the blur. What we are really doing is manually caching data. And the blur memory access pattern is relatively cache coherent as is, so it will likely happen automatically. In my test I got significant performance gains only for the fairly large blurs. But there are things that thrash the cache, like for instance fast Fourier transform. I used it in my ocean system and implemented it with compute shaders. The implementations that made use of group shared memory turned out to be upwards of three times faster than the ones that didn't. 
So if it's relevant to your case, it might be worth it to try this kind of optimization. This is all I have to say. Of course, not all shaders are constrained by memory access, and you need to pay attention to other things. But I hope that I gave you more tools for reasoning about the performance of your GPU programs. If you have questions, or perhaps found some mistakes, please leave a comment. Otherwise, thanks for watching, cheers!